Hi, my name is Rachel Francine. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Musical Health Technologies, where what we're doing is using the voice and turning it into effective, affordable, and highly distributable medicine. Um, I also have a master's degree in something called future studies, which is really the art and science of creating change. Um, and, and so today I wanna to talk to you about both of those things, um, future studies and how we can use it to improve the world for the better, um, and also the science of singing, how we are using the voice to create um, impactful therapeutic change for a variety of clients, and then really also how we are using technology um, to scale that. Um, so to, to get started, um, you know, in future studies, um, we call it, we always refer to it as futures, never in the singular future, because there's always more than one future um, that is available to us. And in future studies, we break this down into the probable, possible, and preferable future. Um, and the probable future is the future that everybody assumes is going to happen. So, for example, in the 1950s, everybody assumed that um, computers would always be as big as a room. And, um, and maybe you could have made the assumption, too, that all computer programmers would be women and the vast majority of them would be would be. Um, African American, because that was what was going on in the 50s and 60s in computing. And if you just take a linear sort of approach to it, you would think, well, okay, this is this is how it's going to stay. But we all know that computers um, got much smaller, and um, it did not turn out, at least um, at least for the current time being, that most of the computer programmers are are women and um, that they're African American. Although we were are catching up, and the reason that we very rarely get the future that is contained in the, in the probable future is because all over the world, possible futures are being born. So the future that we actually got was a computer um, that sits in our pocket or, or on our wrist. And the reason that we get these different kinds of possible futures is because there's all kinds of change going on in the world all the time. And so what a lot of futurists do is they help organizations, governments, individuals really understand all of the different kinds of possible change that may be on the way. Um, and those are driven by a lot of different elements, um, whether that be social change, environmental change, political change, um, as we're seeing right now, um, driven by economic change um, and, and social change. And so um, what a lot of futurists do is they really help um, as I was saying, organizations um, navigate uh, the future by building scenarios around the different types of change that can happen. Um, and, and this is great, um, but my favorite thing about futures is preferable futures. Because what you do in preferable futures is you get all of the constituents together. You go through those scenario planning exercises and you really look at um, how, you know, what are the different opportunities in front of us? And then as a group, as a community, as a society, and this is what they did, um, they used a lot of future te studies techniques um, in South Africa while they were dismantling apartheid. And we decide, what do we really want? as a collective, you bring all the constituents together. And from there, it, it really becomes a strategic planning exercise. How do we get to that preferable future? And the challenge, of course, with preferable futures is we are seeing a, a ton of massive challenges in front of us to get to these preferable futures. And so what I want to do for a couple minutes is talk about some of the ways that I see that we can bring about change um, using some of the, the tenets of future studies. And one of the tenets of future studies is we talk about incremental versus transformational change. So incremental change is when things are happening, of course, little by little over time, and then transformational change is, is when we see, um, you know, sort of a big, um, you know, a, a big change um, all at once, or at least it seems all at once, because most of the time, a lot of little incremental changes are what builds up to transformational change. And this is what we were, this is really, again, what we're seeing in, in, in the protests and, and um, in, in the change that we're seeing in, um, in, in how we are, um, 
uh, how we are, 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 are dealing with uh, police brutality in, in our country today. We are seeing a transformational change brought on um, by both other transformational and incremental changes. I'm a big fan of, uh, of, of transformational change. And one of the reasons why is, you know, we're obviously um, going through a lot of troubles right now. And one of them is um, in, in addition to a global pandemic and, and some tragic, uh, tragic uh, events that are happening around us, um, we also are looking still at climate change. And the way that a lot of people talk about climate change is about bringing on sustainability. And to me, the, the challenge with sustainability is that it seems just really, um, really boring, right? It seems like you're going to be eating oatmeal and wearing sackcloth for the rest of your life. And it's very hard to take things away from people as we are seeing um, once they have them. And so instead of a, a sustainability, I like to talk about abundance. And the idea of abundance is that if we actually create um, the products and the services around us with the circular economy in mind, meaning that we don't think of, of everything that we create eventually ending up in a landfill, but being able to be reused in a circular economy or designed with better principles, we can actually have a lot of the things that we want while healing the planet. Um, and so a couple good examples of this um, are some books. Um, the first one is Cradle to Cradle. And in Cradle to Cradle, they do talk about the circular the circular economy and how, you know, when we are using materials to build things, there's really two types. Um, one is um, the type that is, is, will be non-toxic for the environment. So if you build, let's say, an ice cream wrapper that um, completely biodegrades and possibly even leaves um, seeds for wildflowers flower, in the ground, then you, you, you are actually adding to the system rather than taking away from it. And that any kind of toxic um, element, be they metals or be they chemicals in the, um, in, the, in the production system are actually created on a closed loop. So they're always being um, uh, re recollected and reused. And in doing this, we can create um, products and services without actually damaging the planet. And the example that the folks on Cradle to Cradle use is um, the cherry tree. And that if um, we were designing the cherry tree for sustainability, it would have um, many less blooms on it because they don't seem necessary. But the cherry tree can have as many blooms as it wants because its waste actually adds nutrients to our system rather than taking them away. There's also a wonderful book called Biomimicry in Design where uh, Jean Benus, uh uh, takes the um, principles of how things are built in nature, like that cherry tree, and um, as a biochemist instructs us um, in a layman's way how to do that same thing um, as humans. And so this is really, um, you know, getting back to future studies, the difference between um, incremental and transformational change. And, and what we really need now is to completely change the way that we're thinking and, and bring about transformational change. Um, you know, some of this transformational change that I would like to bring about um, and help bringing about and use my company, Musical Health Technologies, to do that is that I really believe in the, in the quadruple bottom line um, take to economics. So right now, um, economics are really judged in a single bottom line. So for example, most countries, um, you know, they judge their success by what is their gross domestic product. The problem with gross domestic product is that all kinds of good things are, interest, are, are included in gross domestic product. Um, you, know, how, um, you know, how many teachers we employ, for example. But, the, um, but other things like car crashes, um, uh, illness, pandemics, those are also the things that we spend on those elements are also included in our GDP. Just So just because you have a great GDP does not mean that your people are living well. Um, and so there's there's been a, a a change in direction to looking at economics in terms of um, a triple bottom line effect, which is so, which is the economic, social, and environmental, and that if we can create um, products, services, um, change with these sort of bottom lines in mind, then we will actually be able to 
um, create better lives for people. And, and I add in there transformational. I have a fourth bottom line, which is we need to do these things fast because we're really facing crisis. And a lot of these, um, a lot this this quadruple bottom line um, approach is really um, reflected as well in the UN's uh, sustainable development goals, where they never really mention in those goals that we are going to, you know, grow the economy by leaps and bounds. What they talk about is how can we get more people employed? How can we get more people employed um, in gratifying work? How can um, we get more people access to healthcare and education? And so um, these were the things that I learned about in school that I came to develop a philosophy around in school. And so when I started Musical Health Technologies uh, uh, eight years ago now, um, uh, these were the kinds of tenants that I wanted to prove um, a company could use in order to um, uh, in order to create a company that not only is going to generate money but is going to create that kind of quadruple bottom line effect. And so, what we do at Musical Health Technologies is we scale music as medicine, and we do that by using a technique called lyric coaching or lyric prompting. And this is the same technique that Gabriella Giffords, music therapist, used, the congresswoman who was shot when she re received left hemisphere brain trauma. And what her music therapist would do in that situation is they would play the guitar, prompt her her favorite songs, and then she would sing them because when you have left hemisphere brain trauma, it typically affects your ability to speak. But singing takes place in the entire brain. So though she couldn't speak, Giffords could still sing. And by singing actually was able to reroute where speech takes place in the brain. But with only 7,000 music therapists in the country, only a very small portion of people actually have access to this kind of care. So what we first did was create a technology that would allow non-music therapists to implement therapeutic music with people um, and uh, by, by digitizing that same process that Gabriella Giffords music therapist used. So I'm gonna play this short video for you um, to give you a, a sense of what that looks like. And sing out here. And sing out here. Old winter song. Old winter song. But I miss you most of all. But I miss you most of all. My darling. My darling. When autumn leaves. When autumn leaves. Start to fall. Start to fall. It's awfully hard to tell somebody what I experienced. Yes. Because um, it, it was a, like a miracle. And so, and so the miracle that you're saying you experienced was was what? My voice returned. <laughs> So, so as you can see, um, Olivia really had a transformational experience, which is, of course, one of the things I'm going after. And, and the reason that she could do that is because the benefits of prescribed singing are just so, um, so varied and deep. So singing provides a whole brain exercise, right? So this is one of the things that we're saying is the only thing that can um, sort of beat back the effects of dementia. It also 
um, creates great neurochemical uh, regulation. So um, serotonin, oxytocin, melatonin, endorphins, all of these are, um, are positively regulated when you sing in the same way that we try now to use anti-anxiety and anti antipsychotics. This is a way to regulate neurochemicals naturally. Um, singing also supports respiration in many ways. Um, and it also strengthens immunity. Um, one of, um, and, and one of the other things that it does, and this goes back to neurochemical regulation, is it releases oxytocin. Oxytocin is um, what they call the love you know, hormone. And, and what, it able, what it is able to do is it's what, it's what connects us. Um, and I think that that's one of those, it, it bonds mother to child and it connects people to each other and to our animals and, and to our chocolate actually also. We release oxytocin when we eat chocolate. And so what all of this does um, is it connects us to each other. And I believe that that's why during our COVID-19 crisis and all the social isolation, we are seeing even more um, evidence that people use music to self-medicate. And what we're trying to do is make that more prescription strength. What we are doing is making that more prescription strength. Um, I told you um, a little bit about Gabby Giffords already. Um, and so you know her story about how she used singing as a therapeutic tool um, to regain her voice. Um, and, and this really is, this, this lyric prompting process that you heard really is what Giffords herself um, credits to uh, regaining her voice after her tragic shooting. Um, there have been some problems over the years with getting music as medicine and singing as medicine out there, and mostly that there's been a gap in the science. It's really hard uh, historically to study uh, the voice and, and music in general because it's so complicated, but over the past 25 years, there has been a real, um, a, a real uh, surge in the research around that, and we're really seeing the evidence from a clinical level from people like Harvard and McGill and all of the ones we referenced before. Also, there's only 7,000 music therapists in the country, and so you really just can't get the, 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 the solution out to everybody. And so what we're doing is um, leveraging other kinds of therapists, um, giving them the tools and training they need in order to uh, use music as medicine. And then also, you know, we just have not been, we have not been um, really conscious of the fact that we are over-medicating people and, and that our go-to is, um, is just to give a pill. And so that's one of the other things, just we have not been exploring other options as a society. So the first thing that we did as a company is we actually um, digitized that process that Gabriella Giffords music therapist used. So we have that lyric coach in there, that guide singer in there, all of that. So people don't need to be a musician in order to, um, in order to facilitate music as medicine. Um, and, and so, um, the other thing that we did was we went out and we got, um, and this is very important, uh, actual licenses with the publishing company so that we have legal rights to the 500 uh, plus songs that we have in our catalog. Um, but the app on its, the app on its own isn't really enough. And what our specialty is as a company is really based on our deep understanding of, of music therapy and how to scale it. And so what we do is, is the app is part of the scaling, but you also have to understand what are the best practices in, in music therapy uh, for that individual uh, condition and that individual's needs. Because a lot of times, for example, their favorite music is, a, you know, being able to find their favorite music is a really important part and understanding where they are in their disease progress is, 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 is essential as well. Um, and so we understand what the condition is. We have this song printed database where we actually go in and understand, for example, what not only what year a song is from, um, so that we know, sort of, you know, who uh, for whom it might be the most appropriate age-wise, but also, for example, um, how long the sustain in a song is. Because for somebody with chronic breathing problems, for example, you're not going to want to start them out on Climb Every Mountain or Oh What a Beautiful Morning. You're going to want to start them on songs with a lower need for breath support. And so that is all, um, that is all taken into consideration. And then it is um, the outcome of that is we create um, personalized music programs and we do them 
um, in uh, right now our main product as I'll talk about is for a, a group scenario and now we are releasing our SyncFit Studio um, product um, which is one-to-one -one, as well as solo and we are going to be launching a telemedicine platform later this year. And all of this, of course, um, because we're living in 2020, all of this data gets collected, um, um, not only to do some of the, the stuff we'll talk about with voice biomarkers later, but to, of course, improve the process and the algorithm. Um, and so as I talked about in SyncFit, we, we have a group process um, where about 15 to 20 people um, are in a group and um, there's one facilitator leading that group. Um, we created a product, um, this was our first solution, SyncFit Prime. Um, it's, a, a, it's sold mainly into senior living communities. We are all at, at all 260 of those senior living, of Sunrise Senior Living Communities, um, as well as about 250 more uh, that also include small rural hospitals. So what we were able to do is create a product that is both scalable for huge organizations, as well as able to serve um, you know, hospitals in, in rural Wyoming. Um, we have a 90% retention rate among our clients. We're very proud of that um, because once people um, start using SyncFit, um, they very rarely, they very rarely give it up. Um, and so what the reason that they give it up is be, they, they're, they're not willing to give it up is because um, it works. When uh, people, um, even those with dementia, um, attend SingFit sessions, um, we've seen uh, one of our clients did this research study and saw a 40% reduction in anti-anxiety um, medication use on an on a as-needed basis. Um, there's a, a mood elevation in the different uh, studies that we do with our clients. We see anywhere between a 43 and 83 pre and post mood elevation for the, um, for the participants. And, and SingFit gets used um, even within the COVID environment um, because we train the in-house staff how to use SingFit, um, they are really able to um, uh, continue using it even though no outside entertainers or outside contractors are, are allowed in. And, you know, in, in sort of going back to the idea of, of quadruple bottom line and, and creating people, uh, you know, not only work but fulfilling work. Another thing that we're proud of here is that um, we did a survey of the SyncFit facilitators and 85% of them said that SyncFit made their job easier, which is great. And I understand that 15%, not everybody's super comfortable with technology. But even 7% of those people who maybe had a little bit of trouble with the technology said that SyncFit makes their job more fulfilling. Um, and and um, that's really amazing to me. And, and then even to go farther, um, of 8% uh, more um, said even though maybe they don't like their job so much, they do recognize that SyncFit affects their, um, their residents and their participants positively. And so, you know, we're able to, um, on that quadruple bottom line, really create um, a fulfilling work for people and as well by training all of these, and we've trained over um, almost 2,000 um, people to facilitate SyncFit at this point, um, we are creating um, not only more work and more access to music as medicine for people, but we're creating that, that really um, fulfilling work as well. Um, as I said, um, this June, we're coming out with a new product called SingFit Studio. Um, this is much more um, flexible and allows individual therapists to use SingFit with people um, who have different types of conditions. And we will be rolling out different condition courses and protocols over the next, uh, over the next uh, five years. Um, which I'll talk about later. SingFit then, when you're not talking about with someone with dementia, can also be used on its own. Um, and this is really able to um, help with fulfilling the promise of telemedicine because people will be able to, on their own, if they're only going to say a speech therapist once or twice a week or doing a telemedicine visit with a speech therapist once or twice a week, they will be able to have really effective homework that they can do to move um, the process of recovery um, of, say, from a traumatic brain injury uh, forward much quicker. Um, and then, of course, especially in COVID times, we are um, going to be launching a virtual platform in several ways. We've got a couple really, really super exciting um, announcements coming out on this in the next couple of weeks. So I really, um, I hope you look for them or contact us to, to find out about them. 
Um, over the next five years, you know, we, there's 92 articles, um, scientific articles that talk about um, singing's impact on hypertension alone. And we know that if we can bring down um, hypertension, um, we can affect a lot of other conditions as well. But we've, uh, even with that, identified 39 other conditions that can benefit from the use of music as medicine and singing in particularly. And, um, and what we did first was target 10 often comorbid conditions that are disproportionately um, felt by people over 65. Um, and, and there's 144 million of them um, affected. Um, over 65 and under 65 by, by the conditions that we're targeting. And so um, the great thing about SingFit is that, um, to me, is that it really works along the whole continuum of care. So it can be done in sort of traditional settings, um, whether those be hospitals or skilled nursing or the long-term care facilities where we are and in home, um, but it can also be used, of course, as a telemedicine solution. And one of the things that we're finding is that um, there's been a lot of changes in um, reimbursement. And so a lot of these, um, a lot of these um, implementations of SyncFit are becoming more and more reimbursable. Um, right now, all of our clients pay through private, private pay. Um, and so I want to get um, and, and focus now for the last couple slides on, on how SingFit, I mean, SingFit obviously involves singing, and so it, it interacts with voice. But of course, there's a whole voice industry out there. Um, what we see a lot with, the, with you know, voice is that people are using it a lot for diagnosis, um, including Amazon. So this is actually an Amazon slide. Um, where they have been working on using the voice um, to, to create biomarkers to understand um, when somebody is going to have um, either an exacerbating event with a, with a condition or, or when, um, uh, you know, sort of intervention needs to be had. And you can see that Amazon agrees with me. <laughs> There's a lot that can be done and told by voice, whether it's respiratory, whether it has to do with your brain or your respiratory conditions. And so, you know, there are a lot more people getting into this area of voice, which is incredibly exciting to us. Um, this is a little article from Moby Health News that talks about other companies besides Amazon who are really um, getting into the voice biomarker again um, category. And so um, we think it's an amazing time for voice. And what we want to do at SingFit is take it a step further um, and, and really create a, a $1 billion market for what we're calling active voice therapeutics. And the reason that we call it active voice therapeutics is of course, there are biomarkers, and these are incredibly important to sort of understanding um, what the voice is telling us, right? And, um, and so, but that isn't exactly what we're doing, although we are going to look for those things. Um, in the area, and the other thing that we aren't is we're not passive music listening. Um, when you, and, and there's a lot of, um, you know, stuff out there about the benefits of passive music listening, and there are some, but they're more challenging clinically because in order for somebody to really have um, some sort of a neurochemical or, or biochemical reaction to passive music listening, they really have to love and connect emotionally with the music that they're listening to. Whereas with active music making, with singing, um, it doesn't really matter. It's, it, it's the doing that creates the therapeutic change. So of course with dementia, it's essential that you find people's favorite songs, but in general, it doesn't really matter if the person loves the song they're singing. As long as they're singing it, um, like a yoga practice, they are going to intrinsically get the benefits of it simply by doing it, um, you know, whether it's their favorite artist or not. And so, you know, ultimately at Musical Health Technologies, what we are really trying to do is bring about a massive change where um, whether it's for dementia, whether it's a COVID solution, which we are coming out with, or whether it's for a nine-year-old kid who has been diagnosed, um, you know, maybe with a little attention deficit disorder, that the first thing that they're given is not a pill that's potential side effects is uh, maybe death, but instead the first thing that they're prescribed is singing um, in the morning 
to organize their brain um, and, and to create focus, which is, which is something that a lot of doctors are actually rec starting to recommend now. And this is the transformational future um, that we see at Musical Health Technologies. So I, I really appreciate your attention. Um, I hope that you, um, that you enjoyed this presentation. And if you have any questions, either about future studies or about music as medicine and sing fit in general, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, thank you very much to everyone at Voice Global for having me here today. And I hope to speak to many of you in the future.